I'm going to continue on with this, uh, what churches should be doing versus what they are doing. Uh, and, and you'll see the differences here. It's broken down quite simply. This one is about pastoral support. Not only under the present dispensation of truth, but also, of course, during the age of Israel, support from the congregation for those doing the job the Lord called them to do was commanded to be provided. Leviticus 5.13, uh, chapter 7, 6 through 10, Numbers 18.20 through 32, Deuteronomy 14.22 through 29, Amos 4.13, uh, Luke 18.12, also Matthew 10.10, 10, and, and Luke 10.7. Here is 1 Corinthians 9.13 through 18. Do you not know those who officiate at the temple rites eat from the temple, and that those who officiate at the altar officiate at the altar have a share in the altar? In the same way, the Lord has also directed for those proclaiming the good news to live off of doing so. But I have not made use of any such rites. Am I not writing this so that such might be the case for me? And I am not writing this so that this might be might be the case for me. I would rather die first. No one is going to take away this boast of mine. In other words, offering you the truth free of charge for if i proclaim the gospel the good news the whole realm of kingdom of truth this is no basis for boasting since the necessity of doing so lies upon me and woe to me if i do not proclaim it now if i do this willingly i do have a reward to look forward to but even if unwillingly i still have a duty which has been entrusted to me to dispense this truth what that what then is my reward that it that in proclaiming the truth of the good news I shall present it without having to charge for it, so as to not make full use of the authority I have to do so, given to me in the gospel itself. All ministry requires personal sacrifice, but few ministries require the sort of sacrifices necessary to be to become prepared and properly functioning pastor teacher, because of the time and effort required to prepare in the first place, and to prepare for each teaching session in the second place. Few men, however, find themselves in a position to be as dead set against receiving financial support as Paul was in the case of the ungrateful Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9.15. For this reason, as Paul makes crystal clear in the passage above, even in the process of refusing such aid from them, he did, of course, receive support from them. In other words, the Macedonians uh, of Philippians 4.15-18, supporting the pastor teacher so that he may be able to devote his time and energies to studying and teaching the word of God. For the edification of his church is one of the major responsibilities incumbent upon every local church. See my last video. Here's 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11. Whoever goes to war at his, whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say, also, say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while, treading, while it is treading out the grain. It is, is, <laughs> it is oxen God is concerned about? Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, that he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of this hope. If we have s sown spiritual things among you, is it a great thing that we reap your financial material things? Your, your material things, not financial, sorry. Different part. 1 Corinthians 9.14 in the same way, the Lord has also directed those proclaiming the good news, in other words, the teaching of the truth, to live off doing so. Galatians 6.6 6. Let him who receives instruction in the word share all good things with him who gives instruction. 1 Timothy 5.17-18 Let those elders who lead well be held uh, worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and its teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it is threshing, and the worker is worth his pay. So while every congregation owes its pastor teachers respect, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, 1 Timothy 5, 17, Hebrews 13, 7, and also 13, 17, prayer support, Romans 15, 30, 2 Corinthians 1, 11, uh, Philippians 1, 19, Philemon 1, 22, and encouragement, 1 Corinthians 16, 17 through 18, 2 Corinthians 7, 4 through 7, also 7, 13, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 16, and Philemon 1, 7, None of these relieve them of their responsibility to provide the other half of the double honor commanded in 1 Timothy 5.17 above, namely a reasonable level of financial support so as to liberate his time to do what he has been called to do. Clearly, any pastor teacher who is forming a group of believers into fellowship for the first time cannot expect to be supported immediately, and certainly not to the point of relieving him of waging war on his own resources. Sorry, guys, it's winter 
to 4.0. I don't even know. It's crazy right now. But as the church grows, it is right and proper for the congregation to increase their level of support proportionally. This does not mean that the salary of a pastor teacher is to be considered open-ended and limitless. All things are to, to be done decently and in order, as per 1 Corinthians 14.40. As such, the rule of thumb one may one of my well-respected, uh, my teacher speaking here, one of my well-respected seminary professors suggested seemed close to the mark. A congregation which is able to do so should consider paying their pastor the median income of its members. That way, he is neither above them so as to be tempted to be proud, prideful, nor below the others so as to be subjected to bullying and contempt. Embo embarking on the path of pastor-teacher requires courage, therefore. It takes sacrifice and serious investment before the fact to engage in the preparation necessary to be ready to teach the Word of God, and sacrifice and courage after starting or joining a small group where support is at first little or none and prospects indistinct. Okay. It also takes courage on the part of the congregation to commit to supporting a pastor teacher, not to mention wisdom in selecting the right person in the case of group first situations or joining oneself to the right fellowship in the case of teacher first situations. Both parties need to keep firmly in mind, moreover, that nothing is impossible for the Lord and that for congregations and pastor teachers who are doing things the right way, the biblical way, nothing is impossible. Here's Matthew eight nineteen through 21. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of fragments did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. Not ironic. Also, when I broke up the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did it take up? And they said, Seven. So he said to them, How is it that you do not understand? Perfect numbers, people. Any prospective pastor teacher worth his salt would be thrilled at this prospect of being able to teach a group of believers who were truly eager to learn the truth from him and would no doubt be willing to put up with a great deal on this score in order to do so. And any local church blessed to have such a man truly willing and able to teach the word in depth and orthodox detail ought to be willing to do what is necessary to keep him. Matthew thirteen forty five through 46 Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I'm going to go ahead and just leave that there. I don't have any commentary. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read this in years. I know this stuff, but um, I love you guys so much. I really do. Just want you all to grow. Badly. I see all the lukewarm evil around here and it just it drives me nuts. And I don't see anybody standing up for the word. <laughs> Forgive me. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm going to try and keep this short. So bless you guys. We'll talk to you soon.